Everyone hear me? All right. Thank you all for coming today. My name is Kyle Sutherland. I'm one of the chief residents for the Internal Medicine Program. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Michael Charlton. He's a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians. He serves as the chief of hepatology, uh, director of the Center for Liver Diseases, and medical director of the Transplant Institute at the University of Chicago. Dr. Charlton is an internationally renowned specialist in liver diseases and transplant medicine. He served as president of the International Liver Transplant Society. He has applied his expertise to in editorial roles uh, with leading liver disease and transplantation journals, including associate editor for hepatology for transplantation for American Journal of Transplantation and Liver Transplantation. He was also a founding associate editor of the Clinical Gastroenterology and Hepatology Journal. Additionally, Dr. Charlton serves as principal investigator on grants and as a study section member of the NIH, including uh, studies of the pathophysiology of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and for viral hepatitis. He has published over more than uh, over 200 manuscripts and is lead investigator for national and international clinical trials in viral hepatitis and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Dr. Charlton has served as panel member and writer for the American Association of the Study of Liver Diseases for the management of hepatitis C and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Dr. Charlton is leading the discussion today on the topic of liver transplantation in 2023. Please help me welcoming Dr. Michael Charlton. Thank you for the for the kind uh, introduction. I would say it's a particular honor to come to the University of Miami. Could you hear me okay? Yeah, good. It, it, it feels like home. I actually uh, spent a good part of my childhood growing up here. I did 4001 East First Avenue, East Hialeah for a good uh, part of my, my childhood. And coming back here is a uh, particular uh, pleasure, I will say. And also the University of Miami is a storied institution for the liver, probably for many other things that I'm not aware of, but for liver, the founding member, the founding president of the American Association of the Study of the Disease who came from here. You probably have two future presidents, at least on your faculty now. So it's a big yeah. honor and pleasure, so, so thank you. The title that might be in your material that came is a little bit different. I realized as I was just about to come out here that it's actually the 60th anniversary of the first liver transplantation in, in humans. So I thought it'd be uh, it's a good time to, uh, to discuss some of that as well. These are my disclosures. None of them are relevant. I'm not discussing any medical therapies today. So this is my, my father. Uh, he was uh, a volunteer in the uh, Eighth Army in the Second World War fighting in the, in the desert. Al, uh, El Alamein, Tobruk, uh, Tripoli. His life was saved. He was uh, shot. His life was saved by penicillin. Although penicillin was invented in London, it was produced pharmacologically for the first time uh, south of Chicago in a place called Peoria. And he was one of the first to, to receive it. Uh, in addition, the, the survival of the, the Eighth Army in the desert would, would have been totally impossible without uh, American support uh, during the Second World War. And he felt this profound. Is that better? Yeah. He developed a, a profound sense of gratitude to the United States for their assistance, even before they joined formally uh, in 1942. Eventually, uh, when the war in Europe finished, he uh, served in the Far East. And on the way back, uh, he, he decided he had to say thank you in some, in some personal way to the United States for their assistance. And he, and he built this ship. This is a, a replica of the Mayflower uh, here arriving uh, in New York. It eventually made its way south something something in uh, other cities eventually uh, resides to this day in Plymouth, Massachusetts. But on its way south, uh, eventually this is going into Miami. And my mother was covering this, this story for CBS, and that was the American Anglo connection, uh, was, was started right here in Miami. It's like a particular honor to, uh, to be here today. But I will say, my, my father said he was a terrible husband. We ended up coming back to Miami. Uh, and my, they, they divorced, and uh, he had a tremendous sense of adventure, though. So as bad a husband as he was, he was an excellent uh, adventurer. And I think that transplantation and, and medicine in general is most enjoyable when, when you do it uh, for, the, for the adventure. And transplanting really exemplifies this. So in the beginning, Thomas Stossel really, almost as a, as a single person, uh, brought forward this practice uh, to medicine. People often think of the first transplant as happening at University of Colorado. A lot of it happening at Pittsburgh. The first transplantation probably happened right here about 100 yards from us. So Dr. Starsville did his first transplantation of any kind in a dog he picked up from the Miami dog pound and did it in an animal lab at Jackson Memorial Hospital. So the seat of the home of transplantation in some levels is actually right here at the University of Miami. He never published it, but he discussed it uh, at his retirement. And this is his first description when he was at Northwestern doing it on block transplant 
uh, in dogs. He said he was trying to understand rejection, but in reality, I think he was really signaling the world that he intended to do this procedure uh, in humans. Being ahead of his time, uh, machine perfusion is a huge thing in liver transplantation currently. They were using oxygen, uh, hyper hyperbaric oxygen devices to uh, improve organ outcomes even back in the 1960s, so a very um, avant-garde uh, scientist. Now, eventually, they published this. And this paper is interesting. It's called Homo Transplantation of the Liver in Humans. Look where it was published. It was published in Surgical, Gynecological, and Obstetrics. Of all the places you would publish one of the highest impact papers in the whole of medicine, this is where it ended up. It, there were five patients. The first one died on the table of blood loss. The next four died shortly after, between six and 20-something days after transplant from non-rejection-based complications. Uh, frequently, it was infection. The same happened shortly after in Boston and in Paris. The three got together and said, this is not working well. There was a worldwide moratorium that persisted uh, until 1967. Uh, so a four-year uh, moratorium. So quick break. What is the most cited paper of all time? Does anyone know? Anyone know the first author? I mean, in theory, it's the crowning achievement. Nope. Watson and Crick? No. Nope. It was this. It was uh, Ollie Norris. He's an alumnus of the University of Chicago. At this time, he was uh, working at WashU. But this is the most cited paper. It's 300,000 citations and counting. And now it's had a second uh, wave of life because now it's known for being the most cited to people cited for being cited. Uh, so it, it, it'll probably maintain this lead for, for some time. But the point being, it wasn't even an original study. When you read the paper, in the very first sentences, uh, he points out that this is really a description of someone else's work that had never been put into paper before, but was used by many scientists. So the original work done by Wu and Folan uh, was described formally uh, by Lowry. But uh, this the most cited paper of all time. The point being, that even if you achieve what you may perceive to be the crowning glory, the most cited paper in the whole of science, you'll probably be forgotten in the not too distant future. So doing something which has more meaning uh, is worth considering. Anyone recognize this? Kilimanjaro, exactly right. It's 19,000 feet uh, tall. If you were to take the front page of every scientific paper every public, ever published, it would reach exactly almost 19,000 feet. It's the front page of each, of each paper. Which is, this is uh, from analysis in nature. The first 40% of that ascent up Kilimanjaro of scientific papers have never been cited, not a single citation. The next 30 or so percent cited between one and 10 times. You have to get to the top one and a half centimeters of those 19,000 feet to get papers that are cited over 10,000 times. And here on the right side are the 10 most cited papers. I promise you, you almost certainly not recognize any of them. Starzl's paper would be just here. It had just under 2,000 citations, if you can believe it, not, not as many as you would expect. They persisted. This is uh, Julie Rodriguez. She was the first person to survive a year following liver transplantation. Two others survived a year uh, in that year. Dr. Sarzel uh, kept a picture painted by one of his surgical fellows in his office until, his, uh, until he died uh, himself. And I think the the glory of transplant is really shown in, in this picture here. This is uh, Julie uh, returned to her mother's side and, and the joy of life seen in, in her mother's face and in, in her face as well is part of why we do medicine and it's certainly why transplantation uh, is performed. There's no, no greater privilege. Well, eventually it took to the 1980s before it was seen as something which was going to be a relatively routine uh, benefits patients. Uh, there was a, a position paper in the New England Journal, uh, as well as in hepatology, and, and Dr. Snarzel made the comment that, and I found is this about two-thirds of the way through towards the conclusion, and he says, the conceptual appeal of liver transplantation is so great that the procedure may come to mind as a last resort for, very, for, for virtually every patient with lethal hepatic disease. They estimated the need for between 4,000 and 50,000. I think they were exactly right on, on these accounts. In the early days, this is a, on the, the dotted line is three-year survival. The solid line is steroid-resistant rejection. And you see they, they sort of mirror each other. When we started off transplantation, lots of rejection, very little survival. Now it's really leveled off since around the year 2000. No important incremental outcomes in terms of survival. And we lose only 4% of livers ever to rejection. The most common reasons to lose a liver in a life after transplant now are infection, uh, cardiovascular causes, uh, and cancers. So a big change. And that brings us to, to the current. So this is 
uh, Bacchus. Uh, Bacchus was a, a Roman god who oversaw uh, wine and vegetation or, or food and spread this to, to lands far and wide. And in Cornelius de Vos's picture here is returning from spreading uh, wine uh, and food to, to some land. And Bacchus has really uh, conquered uh, the United States. So this is a paper that we, we looked at, we spent a few years with one of our, our fellows, Thomas Carter, trying to see what is the current state of transplantation uh, in the United States. So every single uh, recipient and, and patient listed through something called the Scientific Registry for Transplant Recipients. And you see at the top left, the, the sort of the dark crimson, that was non-alcoholic state of hepatitis, as it was called a couple of months ago. And alcohol just below that, alcohol was shrinking, NASH was increasing, and then hepatitis C was king back then. It was you know 30% or more uh, of liver. So a dramatic change over the course in time of who's undergoing uh, liver transplantation. Now, non-alcoholic state of hepatitis or uh, metabolic dysfunction associated state of hepatitis is running slightly behind alcohol, but NASH is the, or MASH is the most common for, for women and second most common for men and on a trajectory to be the most common for both. The frequency of dying from recurrence of disease actually is very small, as you can see here. These are data from SRTR. The hep C is really a hangover from patients who were transplanted a while ago before we had direct acting antivirals. And you can see that less than 1% of patients die from recurrence uh, of NASH. And even for alcoholic or alcohol use disorder related hepatitis on the far right in green, less than 3%. So recurrence of disease, relatively unimportant cause uh, of uh, graft loss and death. We looked at the entire uh, U.S. experience with uh, non-alcoholic state of hepatitis, now MASH, and graft loss appears to be reasonably indistinguishable, at least in the short term, uh, from other indications. This was reassuring because it's a disease that can recur, of course. A lot of the uh, uh, endocrine and nutritional uh, features, uh, if anything, are exacerbated following liver transplantation. We looked at a more long-term uh, outcomes in the scientific registry for transplant recipients for all indications. And we find that alcohol and uh, non-alcoholic state of hepatitis are actually the worst indications in terms of graft survival. So they initially do well, subsequently no other indication uh, does uh, left well. Uh, and they separate relatively early and then they, they increase their, their separation. It doesn't mean that it's recurrence of disease, but it means that these patients may have other risk factors uh, that lead them to, to do relatively poorly but still an acceptable level of 10-year uh, survival in the region of 65%. I remember when I came to uh, the US from London, uh, arrived in Vermont, which was one of the skinniest states of the union. Uh, and I was still struck by how much uh, excess weight or high BMI there was uh, in, in the US. And that was back in uh, 1990. And you can see the gradual increase in the prevalence of BMI greater than 30 uh, and since the pandemic, which this ends, this figure ends at the pandemic, uh, the rate of increase in BMI has actually doubled. Uh, it's hard to believe, uh, but the rate of increase has doubled since uh, the beginning of the pandemic from 0 0.05 kilograms per meter squared per year, sorry, per month uh, to 0 0.1. Uh, hard to believe, but but true. But the meaning is that the prevalence and the impact of NASH is certain to, to increase. Now, for those who are practicing in transplantation, there are about 9,000 liver transplants per year. How many bariatric surgery procedures per year would you guess in the US? Quarter of a million, 250,000. Yeah, so you'll, you'll be seeing many more patients with, and the most common, about 80% of them are the sleeve gastrectomy. Some of the immunosuppression that we use, so for example, mycophenolate mofetil and mycophenolate sodium is primarily absorbed in the stomach and you lose 90% of gastric absorption with the sleeve. Cyclosporin and tacrolimus is primarily absorbed in the proximal small intestine, which will, of course, be affected by RUI uh, gastric mm -hmm. bypass as well. So immunosuppression management is something we need to be increasingly aware of in patients who've had weight loss uh, surgery, a smaller side. So what other features, uh, what, what else has changed with indications? Well, hepatitis C uh, positive organ donors think has been a, a dramatic change. I'm confident that if in 2014 you had put a hepatitis C positive organ into a hepatitis C negative recipient, inadvertently, you would settle the case. You would never let it go to court. You would settle it because it, there was a likelihood of graft loss or death in the patient would be around 30% at five years. 
The frequency of hepatitis C as a cause of death in liver transplant recipients changed completely with the advent of direct acting antivirals. Uh, so now it's the easiest thing we treat. The only thing better on my clinic is a no-show. It's, it's slightly longer to see a patient with hepatitis C. Uh, our pharmacists pick the drug for them uh, and arrange for the prior authorizations and things like this. And there's been a surge in deaths. So this slide ends in 2018 with 9.9 .9 deaths per 100,000 uh, from opioid overdose. The current estimate is now that it's 50% higher than this. And of course, the, uh, the culprit is largely fentanyl. Hepatitis C new infections are now at 50,000 per year and climbing quickly. And by far, the majority of uh, new infections is occurring in millennials. So we have young people uh, getting hepatitis C again. Now, this is a patient, his name is uh, Lorenzo. He's been in the papers around the country, and I use his name with his permission and his picture. Lorenzo was a patient of mine with hepatitis C, with uh, beg your pardon, primary sclerosis and cholangitis, who was coming in and out of intensive care with episodes of bacteremia. And it was getting very difficult to treat him. He had multi-drug resistant organisms. And after one episode in the ICU, he said, I don't think I'll survive another intensive care admission. And I said, I, I, I agree. And he said, is there anything we can do to get a liver quicker? We tried to work him up for living donors. There were none uh, that we can identify. And it occurred to me, there was this one thing. We could take a hepatitis C positive organ that everyone was turning down and put it into him who didn't have hepatitis C. And this was in 2015. The uh, direct acting antivirals had just been approved. And he was all for it. Uh, so we did the transfer. This is the first human being to deliberately receive a hepatitis C positive organ into a negative uh, donor. The frequency of this has increased subsequently. And now it's uh, standard of care, very few organs to turn down. But having said that, just last week, we transplanted a person who was 2,000th on the list, 2,000th, uh, with a hepatitis C positive organ. They're doing very well. Uh, so there's still not universal awareness of the success in ease of transplantation of uh, hepatitis C positive organs. They tend to be younger, uh, they tend to be leaner, and they tend to donate less after cardiac deaths. These are really sort of the best uh, profile for organs in terms of likely good outcomes. This is an analysis uh, that we did looking to see is there a graft loss associated? Remember, this was the most common cause of graft loss for, up until this point was recurrence hepatitis C. The best outcomes of any group are now seen uh, with hepatitis C positive uh, donors. So total transformation, these are excellent organs, not just for liver, but for heart, for kidney, for lung. All organ recipients should consider this. The other big change has been for HIV and hepatitis C infection. Now on the, the left is John Fung, uh, my co-director and colleague at the University of Chicago with Larry Kramer. Now Larry Kramer was the founder of ACT UP, uh, an organization that absolutely changed the speed with which therapeutics had developed for the, the, the treatment of HIV. He died during the pandemic, a sad loss for uh, the world as a whole, but he was an advocate for, and again, he's been in the news and told his story in his autobiographies, et cetera, uh, he had a liver transplant uh, for HIV and hepatitis C co-infection. And at the time, it was a very high-risk procedure. There were only two or three centers in the country that would do it. Uh, that's totally changed in theory now because both uh, treatments or, or both infections are readily manageable uh, with, with pharmacotherapies. It was a 60% uh, three-year survival. Uh, when we looked at it in SRTR now, it's 82%. It's the same as any other uh, indication. However, it's not really spread. So New York does 10 HIV hep C co-infected patients for every one that's done in Miami, uh, for example. And there are some centers of the country where there's plenty of HIV and hep C co-infections. Seattle, for example, not a single case, not ever. Uh, so there's tremendous disparity in access uh, to what should be relatively straightforward uh, medical and surgical therapy combined. Another thing that has changed uh, in the most recent five to 10 years has been multi-organ failure and multi-organ transplantation. So this is Fontan's procedure. You get it for hypoplastic left heart, and there is no ventricle pumping blood to the lungs after Fontan's procedure. It's really the circulation is driven by venous return, and so you have caval pressures that are typically in the 15 plus range. They can be as high as 25 and this gives chronic uh, congestion. So you have a congestive hepatopathy in patients with Fontan's procedure. This is really like a Kasai procedure uh, for the heart. 70 to 80,000 patients have now had Fontan's procedure and 40% develop bridging fibrosis or cirrhosis. So this cohort of patients is now coming of age and there's a surge, a small tidal wave 
of patients with liver failure associated with heart failure following Fontan's procedure. We looked at the number of these in the United States, and the dark green is congenital heart disease, heart and liver transplantation. You can see this logarithmic uh, increase. Uh, this, when we published the paper, the most recent data was 2019, the number has increased by nearly 50% uh, since 2019. So this is not a one-off, this is a real phenomena. And every center, I think, uh, with sort of the skill set that you have at the University of Miami, one of the few centers that have all the skills that you need to do congenital heart combined with liver transplantation. The issue is getting out of the chest. These chests are almost impossible to operate on. Most cardiac surgeons don't want to go anywhere near them. They've often been operated on three, four, five times. Very difficult to, to, to do the um, heart removal part of the surgery. Uh, they have done them. You have done a few at the University of Miami. I looked before I uh, did this talk. I think you've done three um, heart and livers uh, combined in the last five years. But you see there's a tremendous variation in how, how often they're done in different parts uh, of the country. Outcomes are excellent overall. Uh, and in fact, the outcomes for the heart are better than if you get a heart alone. If you get a heart liver, you do better than if you uh, just get the heart. And the reason is the liver mops up uh, antibody, uh, we believe. But the congenital heart disease combined transplant is a much more difficult indication than for non-congenital indications, but outcomes generally excellent very dependent on volume though. So centers that don't do many, which is almost every center, get terrible outcomes compared to centers that do a good number. And now patients are online. Uh, so patients know where centers are, are doing them and they'll flock to those uh, centers for this exact reason. In the United States, there were 17 heart, liver, kidney transplantations up until the point where this picture was taken. These are four of those 17 that we did at the University of Chicago uh, within a two year period. I was walking through the canteen and I saw the surgeon who gave them their kidneys, Yolanda Becker here, uh, at eating lunch uh, with these four recipients. It was an amazing thing to see and they happily posed uh, for this picture. But now we have, I, I'm gonna guess we get probably a third of the country's triple organ recipients uh, come to seek, uh, potential recipients come to the University of Chicago because they see these stories online and they, and they go to a center that they feel has the capability uh, to do it. We had a patient sent to us from Los Angeles, which is really unusual because the second highest volume, maybe the highest volume center in the country is, uh, is at Cedars. So something that I think the University of Miami absolutely uh, can and, and should be doing as well. So what are the challenges in heart transplantation? At first, it's very difficult to assess the liver. Does it need to come out at the same time when you have uh, heart failure? And you know the answer is it, it, it's, it's maybe. The things that we look at, say INR, part of the MELD score, can be affected by warfarin use. Uh, albumin is not, uh, not, not very helpful. The most nodular liver is often a pseudonodule related to chronic congestion. They may not have cirrhosis. So it really has to be a holistic approach. Uh, and cirrhotic livers, even if it's child's A, tolerate transplantation, heart transplantation poorly, even if the MELD score is low. So you need to be careful. All right, living mm -hmm. donation. Uh, living donation is is an interesting thing. You know, if you have plenty of access to organs, there's no reason to do it. And I think where it, in Florida, you've had You've been uh, you've had very generous donor pool. Uh, not so many transplant centers historically. Now that's certainly increased. So living donation really hasn't been needed much uh, in in Florida in the southeast. Uh, but things have changed. So pre-transplant mortality nationally is around twelve percent per hundred uh, waitlist years, and it's sort of leveled off. Maybe even fallen a bit since we changed the allocation policy to get uh, organs to the sickest patients uh, first but 37% drop out for one reason or another, and about 30% are dropping out because they either died or got too sick for transplantation. So there's still a significant need for increased uh, organ availability. And it's just those two causes down here in the bottom right. So the organ allocation policy changed in 2019. So now you get three points less than the average MELD score at transplant if you have a hepatocellular uh, carcinoma. Uh, so hepatocellular carcinoma used to be the lowest risk of dying on the list because they were highly prioritized for transplantation. As a, as a, a medical um, practice, we nationally guessed at what priority we would need to give HCC, and we sort of overestimated the need for transplantation because the weightless mortality was, uh, was very low, and it's been adjusted several times, including most recently in 2019. The organ allocation system changed from within organ procurement uh, organizations and regions uh, to now it goes around these circles that are 
radiate from 125 and then 250 and then 500 miles out from the donor. So the allocation system totally changed, de-emphasizing uh, the uh, priority given to people with HCC uh, as well. So the increase in wait times we thought would affect HCC uh, transplantation and the need for living donation. This is Christoph Brolsch. He did the world's first living donor. This is the recipient, Alyssa. She's still doing uh, really well. Uh, Dr. Brolsch died uh, just a, a few years ago. Interestingly, he published the procedure before he'd even uh, done it. He just published in the New England Journal his intent uh, to do this, which I think was a unique publication in the New England Journal. So rates for living donor transplantation have indeed uh, increased, as you can see in all three of these. On the far left is living donor liver transplantation as a whole. In the middle is for decompensated cirrhosis, and on the right is for hepatocellular carcinoma. And you can see a 45% increase in living donation liver transplantation for hepatocellular uh, carcinoma. And the numbers have increased. Uh, so right now, the numbers are about another 15, 20% higher than they were in 2019. So there seems to be a meaningful and real uh, increase. So now about 591 annualized transplants for living by living donation in 2023. What's driving uh, HCC? Uh, look, this is uh, data by Zobair uh, Unici, Unici from Anova Fairfax. And almost all of the increase in hepatocellular carcinoma is being generated by non-alcoholic, non-metabolic dysfunction-associated steatohepatitis. So, and this is going back to 2018, as you've seen before, the numbers continue to steeply increase. The amount of living donation that occurs in the country, again, tremendous disparities. Region 3 does some. The University of Miami is one of the few centers in the Southeast that uh, have the capacity to do uh, living donor liver transplantation. But the numbers are still low here, and I'm certain that your patients with HCC and cholangiocarcinoma carcinoma uh, could benefit substantially from uh, living donor liver transplantation. This is the Good Samaritan. Uh, the idea of donating two-thirds of your liver to a total stranger, I think, was unthinkable, even though it happened fairly frequently in kidneys, as recently as, say, five years ago. There's now one center in the U.S. that did, oh, I think, over 60 living donors from total strangers donating to recipients. And that tells you that it's just a matter of system and practice. If one center can do it, that can be translated to other centers. If anything close to that level of living donor liver transplantation from strangers was done across the United States, there'd be no organ shortage of uh, livers. Outcomes, historically, it's been thought of once you had a certain number under your belt, you were good. You, know, you were going to get good outcomes. It turns out not true. Uh, when we looked at a fresh look at outcomes, it depends on your recent volume. And this, these lines are outcomes stratified by recent volume. If you've done more than 20 uh, in the last two years, outstanding outcomes. And if you've done uh, in the lower line is less than five in two years, uh, terrible outcomes, relatively speaking. So how, how to address that nationally? Should you be able to do living donor liver transplantation if you're a low volume center? How do you become a medium and high volume center? These are important issues. So back to tobacco. So we talked about the role of a nutritional, uh, nutrition related liver disease in the form of uh, MASH. The other thing, of course, is alcohol. So, time for another break. We're going to play Weightless uh, Jeopardy. So, David Goldberg in the audience, one of the country's great hepatologists here. David said he wants to take uh, deceased donors for 200. So, we'll go there. So, we have a deceased donor, 28 year old from Fort Myers, uh, is male, uh, had a motor vehicle accident. Two potential recipients. One is a 45-year-old mother of two teenage children living in Melbourne, primary biliary cholangitis, MELT scores 34. He's got some kidney issues, excellent socially, uh, some uh, expected uh, physical findings. Another alternative is a 72-year-old man, Vietnam veteran, uh, lives in Jacksonville, hepatitis C, hepatocellular carcinoma, well within standard criteria for transplantation. MELT score is 11. Uh, which person, uh, the, the adjust the exception male scores 28 for this individual. David, who's going to get the liver? Fiber. 45, exactly, exactly correct. No question about it. No center would really argue it. But what if we change it? Now it's alcohol-related liver disease, uh, the CIPAT, a measure of uh, psychosocial intactness or suitability for transplantation is not, not good. It's 27, minimally acceptable, and they last drank four weeks ago. Uh, Mel scores 27 versus 28. Which one should get the liver now, David? 
clear information about the 45 year old. Fair enough. It's not clear. And that, that's the only point. Now, there's no right answer to this. It's not clear in this instance who should get the organ. But technically, it would be this one because the MELD score is a little bit higher. It's just the, the one higher, so go to the higher MELD score. Now it's a, it's a father uh, from Palo Alto, California. Does that change the equation at all? No, not meaningfully. All right, now it's it's the CEO of Google. <laughs> no one in the room said would probably say that they would do this patient for that reason, but I guarantee you that if this person was listed, that was presented, they would get listed by any center that, that was approached to take this patient and transplant. They'd probably get transplanted in short order. And there's many examples of exactly uh, this happening. All right, one more case. So now we have a 58-year-old man, a father of a college-age son, uh, lives now in Memphis, Tennessee, has a non-secreting pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, not something anyone thinks that you can uh, cure with liver transplant, particularly when it's widely metastatic. MELD score is nothing. Patient self-medicated with a vegan diet, and that's why he presented with a relatively advanced tumor, refused surgery in an early stage, emaciated patient. Should this person get a liver? Surgeon in a house, then yes. All right, this was Steve Jobs. Okay, so he absolutely did get his liver transplant and it ended, as you would predict, uh, died of recurrent disease not very long after the, the liver transplant. So we have major issues with equity and access in liver transplantation to this day. Had, uh... Alcohol has it's been vexing from the beginning. The first adult to get a liver transplant, when you go back and read through uh, Thomas Starzl's paper, was a man with alcohol-related liver disease, the first adult human to get it. And they died not from recurrence of anything to do with alcohol. They died from infectious related complications. And he had HCC that was not recognized, adherent to the diaphragm when you read through the, the text of the paper, died 22 days after the transplant. But from the very beginning, alcohol was an issue. This is Philippe Maturin's paper, a multi-center, multinational study, looking at patients getting transplanted for acute alcohol related liver failure, what I think you might call alcoholic uh, hepatitis. The people who got transplanted, uh, the top 75% one-year survival should be 90% if it was done today versus 25%. So the survival benefit uh, was at least 50%. It probably should be closer to 70%. There's nothing else in medicine, I think, that you withhold a, a, a care that you could easily give, but you choose not to because you worry about uh, potential uh, behavior, at least in AF, unless you had evidence that the behavior would affect survival. So what are the emerging issues with uh, alcoholic uh, liver disease. Firstly, I don't like the term alcoholic hepatitis. Nobody does. It's been changed to alcohol related. I think even then, alcoholic, uh, the, even the term hepatitis is problematic. My own preference, uh, no one has used it except me, alcohol use disorder related acute liver failure. And the reason is cirrhosis is present in 95% plus of patients who have this. So the idea that it's an acute issue, not going, totally not true. Almost everyone has got cirrhosis. And even the features of hepatitis are only present in around half of patients. So the terminology completely inadequate for what we've been treating. And the outcomes are similar regardless of whether you have cirrhosis uh, or present or not in the explant. So not helpful for outcomes either. So before Philip Matarin did that paper, almost no one was doing, as you can see here on the left-hand side, uh, when we looked at current practice after Philip Matarin's uh, paper here, uh, everyone is doing it. Not everyone, but many centers, 73, more than half of US centers uh, are now doing liver transplantation for alcohol use disorder, acute liver failure. It's increased by over 200% uh, percent more than any other uh, indication, and it hasn't really slowed up. Interestingly, though, one and five-year graft survival, and if it was such a bad idea, it should show up in graft survival because if patients drink again, you're going to worry it's going to hurt the liver. Graft survival should at least be attenuated numerically, if not statistically significantly. It turns out the highest graft survival of any indication for liver transplantation is this one. They get better outcomes than any, any other group. Do we do it consistently as a country? So this looks at the frequency of doing liver transplantation for acute alcohol use disorder related uh, um, liver failure. And in the in uh, the SRTR is termed alcoholic hepatitis, a term that still appears there. So we went back and looked at this and wild geographic variations. There are these six states in the Midwest uh, that had not a single person undergo liver transplantation with this indication in any of those six states. You look in the Northeast, and you have states like Maine uh, with the highest frequency, more than 4%. So it's possible that that's happening because there aren't anyone drinking in places like Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska, et cetera. Uh, so we looked at that, and you go into, I found a colleague at the University of Chicago, and we compared 
alcohol-related liver disease in Maine compared to Iowa. So lots of liver transplantation for alcohol, none for alcohol. And it turns out much higher drinking and alcohol-related liver disease issues in Iowa than Maine. So totally dissociated from the actual need for this procedure. It depends on where you live, whether you will live or die from alcohol-related uh, liver disease. So why the increase? This is the percent of people undergoing liver transplantation for this indication. And you can see the impact of the pandemic. It shot up during the pandemic. But of course, it, COVID wasn't the only thing that happened. We also changed our allocation policy at exactly the same time almost as there was a stay at home or shelter in place order across the United States. So whether that had a role, it's hard to say. But what I can tell you is that we've benefited in Chicago enormously from this change in policy. So the Remember these concentric circles that I was talking about? That's how organs are allocated based on geographic proximity to the donor. The outline that you see here around Illinois, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, et cetera, is the old region seven boundaries. Those now have no relevance for organ allocation. It's really based on MELD score and donor proximity. So if we have a patient with a high MELD score for any indication, they can now draw organs from these other, and these peaks are homunculus of population in the United States. So we're now able to draw organs from a much wider and larger population base than, than we were used to. So tremendously beneficial to a patient with a high MELD score. Here's a problem with alcohol-related uh, liver disease and liver transplantation, though. When we looked at the likelihood of dying, with MELD score is our primary allocation system, it's 50% lower mortality for any MELD score if you have alcohol-related liver disease compared to any other indication. So PBC, PSC, uh, non-alcoholic state hepatitis, all of them have about twice the mortality risk that you do if you have alcohol as your indication. So is it fair to use an allocation system uh, that overestimates your wait list mortality probability. So you get a high priority for organs based on your perceived likelihood of mortality. And it turns out that that perception is, is not adequate, is not correct. So the male based allocation system really favors alcohol use disorder related acute liver failure. And the concentric circle policy certainly temporarily has exacerbated this advantage. If you look at reasons that people are turned down, you can't do much about any of them except the one which is usually the reason people are turned down, which is perceived addiction and psychosocial aspects of, uh, of care. So we looked at graft loss in the across the United States. So every patient who was listed as undergoing transplantation for alcohol-related uh, acute liver failure, nearly 600 patients. And as I mentioned before, the outcomes are absolutely outstanding, better than any other indication. So there's no outcomes-based reason to deny access. So it must be recurrence of harmful drinking. So if you look at not just drinking, but recurrence of harmful drinking, it occurs. It's about 12.2%, the range, depending on the paper, 10 to 17%. And that's recurrence to any alcohol drinking higher than that, 30%. If you look at graft loss related to alcohol, vanishingly small, only one group has reported any of it, and that's the U.S. Consortium Retrospective Study, the Accelerate AH study. So graft loss rate is about 3.3%. And, and don't be shy. Is this too high? People who feel like this is too high a recurrence rate, we transplanting too much for this indication, too little. What would be a, an adequate number? David or anyone think, well, what's a target? Who knows? Who knows? I tell you, we can accept for other indications. So for HCC, which is a standard indication, which has got a standardized approach across the United States, 14% recurrence, it's almost always lethal. So somehow recurrence of disease, which is lethal, totally acceptable for HCC, totally acceptable for carcinoma. we used to do for uh, hepatitis C, hepatitis B. But for this particular group, uh, we've decided that recurrence of behavior is enough to prevent access to the life-saving uh, procedures. This is something which we urgently have to reconsider uh, as a field. This is my cousin, uh, Roger Myerson. He's also on the faculty at uh, University of Chicago. Uh, he got a Nobel Prize for game theory. And so I have dinner with Roger when, when I can. And he gives me tips on playing poker. And he has an interest in organ allocation. That's telling him about some of these things. And he points out that for any system to which there is, in his case, economic benefits, the system only works for about three years before people figure out how to get around it. And I don't know how much gaming of the system there is in the uh, transplant rates for alcohol use disorder that came up today. You had a patient that was seen here with a high MELD score. 
you're always concerned if you if you decline the patient, they go somewhere else and get transplanted. There are all sorts of wrinkles to any uh, um, allocation system. But it, I think what is certainly true is however we develop a system, we need one that's more equitable and outcomes-based, including for these patients. I, as mentioned earlier, I think we will be embarrassed when we look back in five years for how we're currently treating patients with alcohol use disorder-related liver failure in many instances. So UNOS is the organization that oversees organ allocation in the US. And in a way that can only be the envy of any student in any endeavor across the world, UNOS gets to fill in its own report card. And here's their report card uh, for equity. So this is the UNOS Access Equity Dashboard, which I downloaded just two days ago. And this shows how equitable. So is there any advantage uh, to some attributes measured by in the far left donation uh, service areas, essentially where organs are procured by an, uh, an, an organization? meld exception, so for hepatocellular carcinoma, et cetera. So geography plays a big role, they say. But for other things, look at the far right-hand side. Uh, so insurance type, they say totally equitable, no evidence of iniquity there. Citizenship, no trouble. Uh, distance, also no trouble. And community risk score, so prevalence of liver disease, no problem. So UNOS gives itself the, the World Cup for equity uh, in organ allocation. So we decided to go back and look see what, what's happening in a way that perhaps wasn't measured here. Now, it's not a typo. It, I did mean to say our unjust uh, desserts, deserts, beg your pardon. Uh, so this is a heat map of organ donation registration across the United States. And there is a six contiguous state region that donated in five years nearly 800 deceased livers to sites outside of those six. They have not a single transplant center in those six states. So. Idaho, Montana, North Dakota, uh, South Dakota. And there are a total of 12 states with not a single transplant center, 12 full states. So it could be that this is fine because no one's dying of liver disease in those areas. So access is equaled out because they're going to Seattle to get their transplant, maybe going to Salt Lake or Denver. That, that would show up in mortality statistics. But if you overlay it with CDC liver disease death rates, these states without transplant centers have by far the highest death rates. Uh, so these are organ transplant deserts that we've not begun to address in terms of equity. And the interesting thing, when you look at the impact distance, it starts at 25 miles. In the VA system, it doubles. Every time you double the distance going beyond 25 miles, you add three absolute percent risk to death. So instead of 12%, when you go from 25 to 50 miles, it goes to 15%. And from 50 to 100, it goes to 18%. So distance is very important. And we really need to address, I think, some of these uh, equity issues and access issues uh, nationally. Finally, rise the machines. I'm not going to do this. It's, it's a real, more of a specialty issue, but we're now able to take organs and perfuse them on machines, normothermically or hypothermically. Uh, and see if the organ's going to work. And this is really turning transplant slightly uh, into a day job, which is an amazing thing. I think no one has a harder lifestyle than transplant surgeons. Uh, but you're now able to look at this thing in the same way we pump kidneys for several hours, can do it in the daytime with ORs up and running. Some of this is beginning to happen in livers as well. And it's shown to prevent or make less likely ischemic type biliary strictures. So speaking with David and others here, clearly this is something the University of Miami should, should have. Now, what's next? And this is my last practical slide. This is um, two groups of people. So on the left is Jun Wang. He has a pioneer award from the NIH. And Piotr Witzkowski, to his right, is one of five T cell, uh, reg uh, T regulatory cell expanders. So we have an FDA clinically approved uh, uh, capability to take T cell T regs out, expand them by a thousand fold, put them back into patients. The problem is it's fairly dilute, not very effective, and it's not paid for it's FDA approved. Insurance won't pay for it. Uh, June has come to us, and what, what he can do is he's currently trying to get uh, uh, T cell cells to only secrete IL-10 once they're honed in, the same way we do for CAR T therapy, uh, by looking for, for IL-17. So they find IL-17, they bind to it, and they start producing IL-10 only in the site of inflammation. Now, on the right-hand side are six patients with, uh, beg your pardon, are six members of the team with Piotr doing our first stem cell-derived islet transplant. So they take patients' fat cells, turn them into stem cells, turn those into islets, and put those back into a muscle flap in the patients. And this is the insulin requirements for the first six patients to have that. Two patients totally off insulin. The company supporting the study is now spending a billion dollars 
increasing the capability to provide stem cell as treatment for type 1 diabetes. By the time current medical students at the University of Miami, I think are in practice, type 1 diabetes will be treated, I suspect, in this fashion. And this is a liver that's been decellularized, populated with peripheral stem cells, then put back uh, into a pig. Uh, this is a bioartificial liver using pig cells in ex vivo, so dialysis for the liver. And this in an animal study on the left is uh, blood ammonia levels in people who got standard of care and the pigs who got yellow phosphorus, uh, but the bioartificial liver surviving on the right. And here's one of those pigs trying to look inconspicuous uh, after one of these procedures. And finally, he's going to show you this movie. And these are, if it works, here you go. These are stem cells growing into uh, small intestine uh, in vitro using fetal bovine serum. So how long it takes to do this with kidneys? There's an NIH-sponsored national kidney project to be able to grow or develop uh, kidneys. It's a long way from this happening uh, uh, clinically, of course, for small intestine. But I do think the face of liver transplantation is changing quickly at several levels, from the way we do immunosuppression to the patients that we do transplant for to improving basic things like transplant equity. So on that note, uh, I will conclude. And I think transplant has always been cool. It's just got better over time, much like the Starship Enterprise. Thank you. It's a thrill to the board, Michael. Thank you so very much. Uh, people are thinking about their uh, questions in the audience. Uh, I would like to encourage everybody to go online. We have a lot of beautiful space here, and there was food. Uh, you're always welcome to join us in these virtual hybrids. So, Michael, to your um, excellent grand rounds, superb. Um, you show maps all the time, time that, or several times, that uh, showed borders by states. And these are states that are political boundaries. But indeed, one can look at other boundaries that occur, such as diversity, racial diversity, uh, economic diversity, that isn't always clearly seen by states. And I would imagine that we would see even greater surprise dichotomies in availability, survival, and so forth. So how do how do you recommend, if you were in charge of all of this, how would you redesign the system so that neither politicians who have one, one mission and clinicians who I do believe like your cousin states are truly economically at some level motivated or hospital administrators are, how would you combine these two approaches and to find a better to find a better system for organ transplant and availability. Uh, important question. So, so thank you for that. I know that the David probably stays up at night thinking about this very issue. Let me tell you how we how we do it now. So let this just say that it was a pot of money that it was one million dollars had to divide it between a thousand people. The current system is that you let the people who you know, can distribute, can get their hands into the pot, choose the rules. So right now it's the transplant centers that are essentially guiding policy development. It's not entirely that, there's also lay people and others involved, but right now the, the centers themselves have enormous input into policy alloc allocation policy. There's some change in that now and the very existence of UNOS itself, uh, it, it's, it's a competitive in theory contract that they have uh, with uh, CMS, I believe, or HRSA. Uh, and it, whether it, they'll succeed in that kind of competition, who knows? People are unhappy with the allocation system at some level, but I think the very way it's developed, it would have to change in whoever sees it subsequently. So I think it should be a mixture. You should get medical inputs, but you should also have people in endocrinology and other medical specialties and there lay you people go. decide it. And probably people like my cousin. <laughs> Dr. Goldberg. Oh, okay. So great talk. So you know, you mentioned you know how we have like standardized you know indications for exception points, and you, know, you practice in a city where there's six transplant centers within a you know ml radius. Do you think there needs to be some standardization across centers? Because if you know referring doc calls you as someone with alcohol associated hepatitis, your answer your center may be different than someone else, or if you're on call versus someone else. Patients don't aren't aware that referring providers, or should every center be sort of free to sort of do it as they please? 
I think some hybrid, David. I think you do need to allow centers to innovate. Uh, otherwise, you get stuck at whatever you're doing at that at that time. So whether you should identify centers that are getting good outcomes and uh, you allow them to uh, experiment, innovate, I think that's, that's probably acceptable. But we do need national policies for these things. Now we have that. We have a national review board, but it's not overseeing this kind of thing. There's nothing to stop you transplanting someone with acute alcohol-related liver disease. But there probably should be some guidance on it. There's nothing enforceable currently. Well, I see no further questions in the chat. I want to thank you all for coming today. Check the chat as well for the uh, link for CME and MOC. And everybody have a great day. And I thank you again.